All right, everyone, this is um, Monday, February 13th, and this is the second quality of life meeting for 2023. Today will be a joint meeting with uh, community development chaired by Councilman Freddie King. Um, and I want to say that the first item will be deferred. So this really is just a community development meeting. That first item will be offered on March 27th. But why don't we go ahead and do roll call and then we can roll through it. Council Member King. Here. Council Member Moreno. Council Member Jeruso. Present. Council Member Morrell. Council Member Harris. Here. Council Member Green. Present. Council Member Thomas. We have a quorum for a joint committee. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move to approve the minutes from the quality of life meeting. Second. Seconded by Council Member Green. Minutes are approved. Council Member King, this is your meeting. I just put them there because it was easier. Council Member Harris, and thank you. Welcome everyone here in, uh, in attendance. We are here to discuss, it says Treme on the agenda, on the agenda, but we definitely have a unhoused population um, issue citywide from uptown all the way to New Orleans East. And uh, what we have here, are just a few pictures of what people in Treme, mm -hmm. there you can see the Claiborne overpass. That's just a few pictures of what these individuals that live and, and own businesses along that Claiborne overpass, what they have to see and go through on a daily basis. You know, it's become a, a health issue, a safety, safety issue. And I know people may say, well, it may not be that much of a safety issue, but we have a speaker. I don't see him. Uh, Mr. Charbonnet, he'll come up and speak and he can tell you exactly firsthand just how much of a safety issue it is. And the pictures speak for themselves. Uh, for themselves, there's very little running water. No, I'm sorry, there's no running water, very little sanitation supplies Thank you. underneath that, that clip on overpass. So uh, although this, the agenda says Treme, this is an issue that reaches way past Treme, almost in every corner of the city. We do have some speakers. I would like to ask that Captain uh, Gaithier comes comes first. I know his time is limited, but to have him come and speak for a moment to discuss from the from NOPD side, uh, what can be done and uh, what is being done, if anything at all. I want to put them on a the spot of talking about things that's being done, but just kind of speak to NOPD's responsibility in this. All right, Councilman, thank you very much. Uh, these uh, encampments usually are addressed through various city agencies, including Department of Sanitation, Department of Health, NOPD. Um, we have uh, various other uh, community liaison officers that attend these uh, cleanups. And uh, one of the things we want to do is always, of course, provide safety for the people doing the job of trying to clean up these encampments. We have low barrier shelters that the city has. There are various things that that can be done, and they we promote that. However, again, this is a, a recur reoccurring issue as far as them voluntarily going to these shelters and seeking the help they they really need. Some of them, the police can only assist these agencies as much as we can, and you know we get we get the fact that they're an eyesore and they, they do sometimes cause problems. We've had serious uh, issues with, with them as well. However, we try to assist everybody as far as uh, everyone concerned with uh, addressing these issues. It's a, it's not just an o NOPD thing. And if we are willing to assist anyone to get these things, get these uh, 
places cleaned up and we try to do that and any violence that occurs in there we address but it's very difficult for us to police that singly and then just do that and tell you that problem's going to go away because uh, arresting homeless really isn't going to really solve the problem here right right um are there any questions or comments thank you uh commander i appreciate it can you tell us specifically how you assist the uh, Department of Sanitation and the Health Department with the cleanups and how often they're scheduled? I believe they're scheduled at least monthly, sometimes biweekly. So what happens is we get our whatever district that they're uh, attempting to clean up at that time. We have our community liaison officers from several districts go with those various agencies to get that accomplished. We always try to uh, accommodate, even if it's short notice, but we usually have a schedule that we maintain and we disseminate throughout the district captains and they get their quality of life officers. I'm sorry, their community liaison officers to address that. Were there any uh, cleanups scheduled pre Mardi Gras for any of the encampments specifically to address the encampments during Mardi Gras and, and having folks clear out if they can or get to someplace safe? I can tell you during the Mardi Gras season, it's difficult to get everybody together to do that. And particularly officers with our Mardi Gras schedule, it's a hundred percent, you know, everyone on deck working. Uh, it's very difficult to schedule that. The other agencies also, the Department of Sanitation works through parades and the health department and uh, their schedule. I know they don't have any cleanup schedule during Mardi Gras. I believe they did have one a few weeks ago uh, that they scheduled and we also assisted in that. but. For the Mardi Gras season, based on staffing, it's really difficult to get that accomplished as far as days off. And, you know, our schedule is really uh, based around the parades and the parade routes and the long hours the officers are working. Why is it necessary for NOPD to be able to assist in uh, these cleanups? What do you all do as law enforcement agencies? We are there Purely, if anything happens, they can address it. So when the Department of Sanitation, say, comes around and if some property is left abandoned, they may pick it up and, and you know, either throw it away or I don't know what they do with it. But we have had some people that really have issues with, you know, they believe that people are taking their things. And that's really not the case as they're abandoned. But the NOPD will step in and try to protect those agencies from any violence or, you know, being being feeling unsafe. And why can't you displace the people who are there? Is there something that's uh, that requires the NOPD not to displace or arrest? I would say we would have to have a city as a complainant to do that if it's their piece of property. While we're, if we were to displace them and they don't go to the shelter, that would just mean it would probably be a burden upon the residential neighborhoods. And as we've seen in the quarter, when uh, they were displaced from the naval base, the amount, as uh, Councilman King can tell you, the amount of homelessness and uh, really right there around all the businesses. So unless they have some place to go, as I said, and they're willing to go there, then it becomes a bigger per, uh, burden on the neighborhoods that that's what's going to start to happen. And the underpasses are state property. While we clean them up as a city, the underpasses are run by- That's correct. Uh, underneath the Claiborne Bridge, that's in, uh, and actually 90 is actually a state uh, highway. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Green, I know this is part of your district as well. Yes, it is. The only issue, Councilman King, is that I don't know what the police can do at the end of the day. I appreciate your work, but you go out and protect. For example, this morning, I took these photos this morning. So for the record, everybody, this is what happened this morning at 8.30 a.m. This is what you see. And if you go a little bit further on those photos, it'll show you that we're not just dealing with homelessness. First off, that's a collection of bicycles. And if you walk on the Claiborne Avenue, so many people have bicycles. I don't know where they're getting them from. I hate to think that I know where they're getting them from. But there are so many people selling, I mean, parts and making repairs to bicycles that it is something that we have to address. The only um, thing that I'll say is that I understand the limitations relative to the New Orleans Police Department and what you can do. But there are, we also should be concerned just in terms of general health. Today, for example, this morning, representatives of the health department were there to distribute Narcon. 
NorCal. It was interesting that there wasn't a police officer there at a time that you were distributing something that deals with that, but maybe you're just putting it into people's hands and it's not an issue, you know? And um, I'm not coming to a conclusion because we're going to have others who comment and I'll comment in general, um, maybe afterwards, but I'm, not, I'm seldom lost for words, but I will say this, we can't ignore the problem and think that it's going to go away. And if you will say this, those who are sensitive, who are in the community, I'm sensitive too, but people are dying under these bridges. The reason that they're under the Claiborne Avenue overpass is to protect from rain and things like that, because it's not to be nearer to services. For example, Odyssey House has services not too far away. You can go to the clinic, but there are a lot of people who don't want to go. I just hope that we can have a full, mature discussion. I recognize that the Supreme Court has put limits on um, what you should do relative to those who are homeless. And I have the greatest sympathy in the world, but I also have the greatest sympathy in the world for those who have invested in their community, who wanna park vehicles under the bridge, which was what it was designed for that parking area after that land was taken by the federal government to build this interstate. Those who are concerned about health need to be concerned, recognizing that people are dying and unfortunately they're being they're being fed drugs because we don't have any control as to what's going on. In my district, um, uh, my district, District D, two people were shot to death not too long ago in their tent. Can't be any witnesses because there's nobody around. They were just in an area that was darkened off of North Johnson or North Roman Street. And it's just a tragedy that those things happen. Um, but I really don't have many questions for the police. I have questions for others. I appreciate the work that you all do. And I understand your limitations here. You really can't arrest someone for being homeless. And if you did, how long would they stay? The Supreme Court has ruled that being homeless is not a crime. And so therefore, my questions are reserved for others who are in the business of and who purport to be in the business of helping those who are unhoused. And I'll have questions a little bit later. But thank all you right. all for your work and for the fact that you all act within many limitations often. Thank you, Council. Council Member Jerusa. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today, particularly during Mardi Gras season where we know you have a lot going on. Uh, I just my, my one question is this. So the law, as I understand it, is um, people are allowed to stay on the street unless there is available housing for them. So and this may be a health question rather than an NOPD question, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. What happens if there is enough housing available and somebody doesn't want to take advantage of the opportunity to go to housing? Does that put you all in a, in a tough position? I believe it does. Um, you know, forcing someone to go into housing is really not something that the police department oh I, I don't even know how we could really enforce that really what laws i understand that law but is that's a law if i we can't really force them to go somewhere we can move them in the, temporarily but they'll just come back and we can't just once we move them we can't guarantee that they're not going to come back and we work with everyone involved all the agencies as much as we can Whenever they ask for help, if they plan on doing a cleanup, we will be there. We will assist in any way we can because we do want to have everyone's safety in, uh, you know, in, as a concern, not just for the homeless, but also for the uh, workers that are going there to do that job. So that's why we're there and that's why they communicate with us to get it done. But I'm not, I'm not sure what it is we can do. And it, again, really, if they resist and say, hey, then we get into another sort of category that we want to get into yeah i mean it this <laughs> this is a complicated problem because we don't want to put nopd right in the middle of it and i think at the same time um we know that there are there are people who have their businesses and other things that are right near there and that and this makes it really hard and i think it's part of our ongoing conversation which i know um you all are trying to lead on is how do we have a homeless person who is at the front of documentation, making sure we're providing right services, what is available, because I think that's the other problem too, is I, I, I don't know that we, the council, know the full expanse of, this is the addiction services available, these are the housing services available, these are 
the, the veterans uh, association services that are available. And I think having somebody who can provide herd all over all of those things in order to help everybody involved is important. And to follow up on that comment, um, Council Member King, Council Member Jeruso, we have allocated money for, budgeted for as a city council and in-house, in-city government embedded homelessness services coordinator. They start on Ash Wednesday, which I know is a little bit too late to address this Mardi Gras season. The purpose of that uh, person in that position and that office is to make sure that services are not siloed into one particular agency or nonprofit, but to really coordinate those services. Again, I think this council took a big leap in making sure that we have somebody who is embedded and within city government. They start on Ash Wednesday, but they are coming from uh, Baltimore, which also has um, a homelessness issue, but they've done good work on that, um, that problem there. And I'm hoping that they'll do the same amount of work here. The other person that we as a council um, asked for, allocated, budgeted for is a national person to tell us what other cities are doing, best practices, putting a plan together. Um, we have allocated that money, but that money has been held up in the procurement process, which unfortunately is archaic and that we're gonna try to solve as well. But um, just know that we are trying to do everything that we can right now to address an embedded person, come up with a plan. And I see Angela here from Unity who can talk about the reasons for homelessness, which is really a fundamental lack of affordable housing, which I know we're all very concerned about, but I understand the impact on businesses. I talk to businesses within my council district as well. I talk to people within my district and they are impacted by this, but of course we can't just go out and arrest homeless folks for being homeless. The law does not allow us to do that. Correct. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So we have a lot of people that say, um, it seems like if you break the rules in the city, you get more more protection from our city government, our NOPD officers, than those who keep that, um, that don't break the rules. And I know that's not the case, but I'm just letting you know, I'm sure you've heard it already. That's the sentiment that people have that I do everything, I pay my taxes, I clean up, I run a business, um, I cut my grass. I don't have litter and debris in my front lawn. But those that don't do what I just mentioned, they get told they can't touch them. They can't do anything to them. Uh, and the illegal stuff from running the generator in a tent, watching, <laughs> washing clothes, hanging clothes over the fence, TVs illegally hooked up to, um, city city um, electricity, it seems like that those individuals don't get told anything in the, in the encampments grow and grow and grow. Is you, can you speak to, to like, what can you do? Um, as in, and, and I'm gonna see we have our um, commander, Allen of the, the first district and all of a sudden, I'm sorry, I forget the name. But... Uh, Christina Vo, the community liaison officer for the first district. So you see and have seen a lot. Um, can y'all speak to let the people know that what is that you can do? What, what are your limitations as far as the unhoused homeless um, population under the so, right. First, let me say this. We are working with our partners with the health uh, department as well as the sanitation department. And doing these cleanups, um, actually, we reached out to our partners uh, before this and uh, were not able to do a cleanup until after Mardi Gras. Um, Councilman Green, I, I also heard you say about the bicycles that was out there. I had some detectives that actually went out there to check the bicycles to make sure uh, these were not stolen bicycles. So we, we did go out and check that. None of them came back as uh, registered as stolen. Uh, we did know that we, we do have information and actually observed that one individual is out there fixing bicycles, old bicycles, but none of them did come back as stolen. Uh, I brought the community liaison also out with me to ensure that we are constitutionally uh, under the bridge doing the things that we uh, have to do as far as enforcing uh, the municipal ordinances and laws of the state of Louisiana as it relates to our homeless population. Uh, 
uh, I, I will say this, in investigating some crimes, we also have to treat their belongings uh, or let's say the facilities that they have, the tents, as though it's their residence. So even going in there, we do have to obtain search warrants to go in there as though it's their residence. Uh, we are the first district enforcing uh, the laws and municipal ordinances. I will say this, we historically, we have not had any incidents reported. Um, last Mardi Gras at that location, uh, the festivities that happen every Sunday or even uh, a week ago at the uh, Treme Sidesteppers uh, uh, Parade, we had not, we have not received any reported incidents of uh, violence or property crimes at that location. Uh, we are constantly interacting with those uh, uh, citizens who are under that overpass uh, daily. For this event that's coming Mardi Gras Day, we are actually putting officers in patrol around uh, that Claiborne corridor as well to make sure everybody has a great, you know, time and safe uh, in their community. So we are paying some attention to the community to make sure everyone has a safe time during Mardi Gras for this event. So uh, we are enforcing the laws that we can enforce. Okay, uh, again, we cannot just up and remove them because it's not, we, we don't have a law to say that it's, it's against the law to be homeless. Okay, so uh, I, I think as we continue to work with our partners, other government entities, that we can come up with a solution um, that all sides have, a, a, you know, better quality of life. Um, and and again, I didn't know that health department was going to be out there this morning, giving Norcan because if I did, they would have had an off exit. Also, that sitting next to me probably would have been there with her with them. Uh, so we did not know that. But the last email exchange that we had, uh, that no one would be out there until February the twenty third. Okay. Well, I want to acknowledge Council Vice President Moreno just step to the back. Uh, and I'm not sure if we acknowledge Council Thomas for being present as well. Um, another, you got a comment? Um, first of all, thank you guys. Uh, just to add some um, insight, uh, several, I guess a couple of decades ago, there was a, uh, a joint committee uh, with the Downtown Development District, uh, Unity, uh, the various city agencies, they were uh, trying to take a look at not just best practices for how we deal with the homeless, but how do we begin to coordinate a facility, a public-private partnership? They had found a uh, strip of land uh, that they thought could do two things, well, three things. Uh, it, it could be a space for folk, uh, if they're, especially if they choose to be homeless, they could be in that particular space. Secondly, uh, it was near where you could have some social service agencies uh, begin to deal with them from uh, housing uh, to whatever the, the addiction was. And I thought it had reached a, a point where the plan had the potential of moving forward, but then it just went away. Uh, the cities that have been successful, when they were successful, uh, the, the, the question has been sustainability. Uh, even in Orlando, uh, at one time, San Francisco thought it had tackled the issue at some other cities, but it was it was always about sustainability, uh, temporary housing, transitional housing, and a commitment in terms of the public-private partnership uh, to make sure that whatever the success was, that it would be maintained. And that has, has not uh, happened. The other thing in terms of some of our own uh, street detective work uh, is that What's happening with uh, fentanyl and cheap drugs, especially the ability to crush the pills right now, uh, you know, as someone who comes out the community, some of us got some of those relationships. You know, when you crush up a fentanyl pill, that's almost back to the cheap crack days. In many cases, it's cheaper. You, you can take just a portion of the pill and mix it and or just really just use that particular pill. So there's so much uh, uh, drugs on the street and it's influencing uh, the homeless population a lot more now than it was back in the uh, uh, late 80s uh, and early 90s. So then the question is, 
if you don't deal with the drug issue, that's major, you know, because I worked at Covenant House, right? Uh, you know, there are a lot of families who send their kids and the people in their family here and send them a check. They go pick up a check at the P.O. box. Oh, we didn't know that? Just so they don't come back to the city or the home where they're from. And they'll actually pay them to stay here where they think it's more acceptable. So, you know, it's a, this, piece, this piece is a whole lot more holistic than people think it is. And, and in, in the current times right now, the drugs and cheap drugs, actually for people who want to get off the street are actually standing in the way as much as housing. So, you know, at some point, you know, the federal agencies and our state agencies and the business community, if you're going to address this, it, it's, it's bigger than just the city right now, period. And then the second part of it right now is that while we want to help our unhoused brothers and sisters, the pressure that is putting on residential communities and business communities, it's affecting the tax base, it's affecting customers, and it's exploding. It's not just downtown anymore. You know, everybody know I'm famous for the homeless video. What the first part person wasn't homeless. And then secondly, what they're doing is any neighborhood they can go to and set up shop, they feel like they can. And I pay one of the guys to clean up the corner now. Instead of arguing with him now, I play him, but, but he's, you know, so it's, 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 it's a big deal right now, but it's affecting business owners and residential people to the point where it's actually making their, it, it's, how would I say? Everybody can't be hurt by trying to help somebody. Period. You know, if you're trying to help me, but it hurts somebody else, that ain't a win. Excuse me, that's not a win. We got to find a way where everybody gets help. Thank you, Councilman Thomas. Um, real quick, before we have someone else come and speak, this picture here, it's, it's not in Treme, it's actually in Bywater. And um, I'm going to read the email associated with two emails associated with this particular picture. It says, good morning. I hope you are well. I live in your district at such and such address with my husband and six-year-old child. We have lived in our home for nearly 10 years. And that entire time, there has been a vacant lot across the street at the corner of, this is Murray and Marini. Um, Recently, in about the last month, a group of people have set up an encampment here. It is growing larger on a daily basis. See attached for the most recent photos. In addition of no, no trespassing sign, so the people who have illegally encamped there have put a, a no trespassing sign in the yard. Uh, my husband filed a complaint regarding our concerns for 301 that remains pending. We are concerned that there has been no response and we're not sure how to proceed. Can you advise? So there's been, there was a, a chain of emails that went out and this is a response that we had from Unity. So Unity, who is president, they kind of speak, they come up to speak. They went out, assessed the, the situation and um, they identified the two people they have visited, I'm, I'm gonna keep their names also. We visited John Doe and Jane Doe uh, at this homeless encampment on yesterday and observed the empty lot with a large amount of debris. They met with the, uh, they met with the homeless man there who came out of his tent and stated that he and his female partner came to New Orleans four years ago from Mississippi and became homeless while here. The man and his companion refused his, and, the man and his companion refused any homeless shelter referrals and said that they were not interested in housing. The companion refused to come out of the tent and talk to the outreach workers. So we have a, a situation where we sometimes individuals just don't want help and they come from other cities, come from other states, and they make a mess of our streets. 
and they affect our residents' livelihood. It affects their their entire quality of life. And I feel like this situation is growing by the day. If you exit Chapatulas, the, the number of tents and, and, and uh, grills, and everything is just growing, growing. That's like one of the entrances to our city. So I, I'm not saying arrest everybody, but at some point, something needs to be done. And something needs to be done. And I'm thankful for the homeless, uh, the, the unhoused um, czar that's going to be taking office next week on the 20th um, because something needs to definitely be done sooner than later and this situation is growing by the second. I want to ask before I give up the mic, I don't see this issue in other surrounding parishes. Why is it because of in, um, enforcement or is it because of why is it? I'm not sure what those laws entail in the other parishes, but I can assure you probably has to do with enforcement. And and just as a conclusion for us, the NOPD, the way we, we look at it, we're willing to work with everyone. And I, and I do believe it's an all agency effort that needs going to need to come to this. Uh, we will provide as much help as we can always. And we always do when we're notified and we see something, even some of our officers try to reach out to some of the homeless and give them all the programs available, the housing. And as you say, it, it's got to be voluntary, but how do we get them there is a problem as well. Some of them don't even want to lose their things, even though to us, it doesn't look like much, but to them, it's all their worldly possessions. And for us to take, sometimes take that is a problem for them. And they don't want to lose it in those low barrier shelters and things that we have because they're not allowed to bring all that with them. So to them, that's all the possessions they have, and they don't want to go in there. So I, we know that as well, just based as being a former district commander myself. I just think that really we're willing to help with anything that you anyone can come up with, and nobody here or no one here can singly come up with one solution, you know, because that's why we're always talking about it. But we definitely, as a group effort, probably need to sit down and something like this. Had we known about this, we can get that cleaned up. The district cap the captain will get that cleaned up if he knew about and assist bringing the other agencies. But I just don't think based on what we have for our personnel that that's something we drive. And I think uh, if we see it and the, and the officers sometimes go out and address it, I've seen I've heard stories of officers just giving people money just to get, you know, people to get some food. And I know that's for a fact, too. But again, it's like as we do our part, we don't want to see this either. You know, we are residents of the city as well, and we don't like to see this, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, it's kind of an eyesore sometimes. And, you know, people, it's not really a good setup for visitors as they, you know, come to the city for various events. And I get it. And the business owners are suffering as well as the residents. But if we we are willing to elaborate with anyone who can come up with a solution and assist as much as we can, because I just don't believe arresting them is really the only solution that we have for NOPD. We can do various things. We have community liaison officers. We have our own community engagement officers. And we spend an awful lot of time, not just based on the requirements of the consent decree. Our officers have been doing this forever. It's just, they label it now community engagement. But I just wanna say that we are willing to help as always to assist anybody solve any solution, but particularly this is a growing solution. Well, um, I was and told I about this picture here um, that the city can't do anything about this because of the private property. And the city won't go on private property and remove trash. So once again, the people who seemingly break the law are protected by the laws. And I would say this, I also know, I, I'm pretty sure the city could probably, once they're uh, labeled a very bad neighbor, could probably do that and somehow force them in the court. I'm not going to tell you what to do with that, but however, the police can't just take them to court on that. That's going to have to be, again, various agencies to or city agencies to look at that and get that done if they're brought to their attention. Thank you, Councilman Moreno. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, both of the chairs for, for holding this important meeting. And I completely agree with you. I do not think that this is 
just a, an NOPD problem. You certainly can't, you know, just arrest your way out of this problem. And I agree with you that the solutions are really complex. And I'm just going to um, state again um, and, and emphasize what, what Council Member Harris talked about earlier. You know, the council has taken two very significant steps led by Council Member Harris on this matter. One is, is bringing in place that, that um, lack of a better term, uh, preventing homelessness czar uh, to, to really be you know, the, 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 the person overseeing this whole issue. But, but more importantly, is bringing in the consultant who's going to be about finding what's working in other cities and what's not, and finding what is that solution that involves all city agencies, that involves nonprofits. What does that really look like? Once again, I just checked on it. That's why I went to the back on the procurement of that absolutely stuck in procurement. And now it's apparently possibly coming back to the council. And I mean, the fact that it's like, we can't get this moving faster and there's not enough urgency around getting this done faster is, is really frustrating because you're right. That solution needs to be all encompassing. Um, you know, bringing unity to the table, I think is gonna be uh, important. Um, the health department as well, but but I think it's it's about how do we how do we do I, for lack of a better term uh, um, kind of that that persistent urgency and nudging to persistent nudging with urgency for somebody to get help because if someone is dealing with significant mental health issues with significant substance abuse issues and they see you all every once in a while and you talk to them about what available help is out there for them. I think that's great. But if it's, and then the health department comes maybe two weeks later, tells them the same kind of story and then unity. I think that's great, but it really needs to be daily interactions, several interactions a day to individuals like this, where it's almost um, to the point where it's like, man, I, I got to do this because they keep, they keep coming around. You know, I, I've got to try to move in this particular uh, direction. Um, and, you know, I think we need more of the of the constant um, of the 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 constant uh, cleanings that we have under the bridge as well um, to be part of this whole process, and then really find you know who 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 can we get that assistance to? Because what I keep hearing from different providers is that there are, there are housing opportunities. There are housing opportunities for those who are are really wanting to get off the street. Like there there it, it can be something that is accomplished. So how how is it that you know we 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 get to the ones who are currently on the street and creating these encampments, those who are really because of their illnesses and substance abuse problems are kind of choosing to be there. So it's such a complex issue. I say all of these things and bring this all out because it can't just be solved with one quick thing. It can't just be solved with one quick agency. But we have to move with urgency and move faster. And this procurement situation, I'm trying to get this consultant in to possibly find us that overarching, you know, solution needs needs to be picked up. And whether it has to come to the council or whatever else has to happen, um, we, we've got to move that forward. So any assistance that you can do to, to help nudge, we'd appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I, I guess it wasn't really a question, but just kind of agreeing with everything that you'd said before that this is really complex, but we have to keep working with urgency around it. Thank you. Council Member Jeruso, followed by Council Member Thomas. Um, I guess just to put some emphasis on both that one is obviously we can't let process delay us. I know you, I know, well, I'm watching the faces up there and what what I'm seeing both from, from the dais and from up here is that process can't be the problem. The other thing too is when you have one agency trying to do something that is a complicating factor when you have five agencies involved, good luck trying to get a whole lot accomplished. And I think, you know, again, Councilmember Harris just speaks to not only the urgency that Councilmember Moreno and, and you talked about, but also the fact that there has to be this multidisciplinary approach that is integrated and seamless. And it's unfair if NOPD is ready to go on a Monday to go do something that the health department isn't ready that day and maybe safety and permits is ready and maybe code enforcement isn't like that, that, that there needs to be. And, and it's easy for me to say that because I'm writing checks for departments. I don't have the cash, but it, it's, it's, it's gotta be something where 
we are looking to the administration to find a way to handle this because it's not just it's with blight too. We ask you all to be a part of the blight process as well to go in to help out with the problems that are there. When in fact you need code enforcement as part of that, you need unity as part of that, you need the health department there. So I I, I think part of this is also now to the chairs, to, to both council members King and Harris, is how do we ensure that that particularly when you're dealing with unhoused population, when you're dealing with blight, you're dealing with some of these other problems, that because it involves multiple agencies, departments, both inside and outside, that there is a consistent coordinated. I know, I know, I know. I mean, I'm watching council member Harris who's saying, I've only been talking about this for the last months, but I think, I think, you know, there's no, I mean, NOPD is here. Thank you all for, again, the second time for being here while you, but you know, the relevant, the other relevant departments are not. And I think it's, it's now a question about who owns it and making sure that it actually happens. Councilman Thomas. Uh, you know, one more time, uh, they've dealt with uh, the homeless population. The cities have dealt with the homeless population like they've dealt with, with crime. You intervene when it, when it peaks and when it spikes and when citizens get mad then it's suppressed. It is never a sustainable, it's never a, a method where we resource impact communities or whether it's sustainable. And, and just uh, for Council Member, Member Harris who, and Council Member King who have uh, uh, been yeoman on this piece, there's 150 million people worldwide uh, that are afflicted with this today and it's a growing problem. Uh, there are only four cities that have been successful. Uh, Helsinki, Finland, uh, Vienna, in America, there are two, Columbus and Salt Lake City. And the only way they made a sustainable impact on, on homeless and houseless was through affordable housing. It, 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 is, it is the only way you will create an opportunity that is sustainable. And not only did they create affordable housing, because what's happening right now is that the downtown or the core of the city, the economic engine, they have the resources to push people to the edges of the, of the core and push people to the edges of the boundaries of the, of the cities. Other cities use their resources to put people on buses and send them some places where maybe it's not enforced, or maybe they can, you know, the, the other cities allow it or, or, or are not as, how would I say, uh, a lot is lenient when you talk about housing. But the cities that have been successful, the two international cities and the two cities in America is, have been by providing affordable housing in the city center, period. So while we think we're protecting folks' economic engine, city, city center or the city core has been the only model that has worked worldwide. And so there are four models out there. Uh, other than that, if we don't do that, if we don't have an affordable housing plan that provides for affordable housing, we're going to shift, shift, sh and shuffle the the, the 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 houseless population around, and it's going to slack off a little bit. People are going to get relaxed. You're going to have a, a more economic crisis. And it's going to pop back up again, like it could, like like crime continues to do. So, those four models have been out there. You know, out, out of the the world's 150 million people, those are the four that have been more sustainable. And uh, Chairwoman, I think you can start there, especially with looking at what they did to address the houseless, and what they did to address affordable housing. Councilmember Green, and then I can uh, talk a little bit about affordable housing, but I know we want to get to uh, public comment. I just want to impress upon everyone the significance of this problem. Could you go through, uh, Mr. Tony, a couple of other slides? I'm going to ask you to stop at one where I visited this morning. Hmm. If you start there, it's all the way at the end. And I don't have a, I'm going to tell you all that I'm just going to make a statement right there, right there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Charbonnet, who has invested in his business for decades, should not have to smell 
but you can smell from that location, which is between two interstates, the up ramp and the down ramp. There was a dog there that was loose to protect those persons from entry, presumably by the public or the police. And the moisture can't go away because there's no covering. While we talk about this situation where they solved the problem and other issues, and look, I've read about Salt Lake City. They invested hundreds of millions of dollars. The problem is they still have 2,000 people homeless. We don't have 2,000 people homeless. At the end of the day, we have got to be concerned about, just as we talk about in the area of crime, the victims, the people who have a right to live near there and not have to smell this. I don't have a conclusion, but I appreciate those who are here because they've invested in this particular community. This particular community is of interest to me because certainly it is the community that I represent. But we have got to have, and maybe the homeless czar and the analysis and the consulting will help us. But this is not New Orleans. This is something that we really need to address. I'd be willing to go to those persons and find them a place if I had a Section 8 voucher for them. But that's terrible. And I know that people are suffering in terms of their health because of places such as this. And I want to do something about it because I'm very, very motivated, um, as we all are very motivated. But once again, without using a particular name, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used somebody's name, but Mr. Charbonnet has not been hesitant to express his concern. That's right behind a parking lot that people use when they're going to funerals. And they have to smell what I smelled this morning. And that's unfortunate. That's all. Uh, I listen, I agree. Nobody should have to see this. Nobody should have to live like this. But Angela, Angela from Unity can talk about the vouchers. There are people who are holding vouchers who are living underneath the bridge who cannot find affordable housing. There is a lack of affordable housing, period. And what we can do as a city council is try to get public-private partnerships to make affordable housing, but there's not enough to go around for the people who are holding vouchers. I think um, Grace at the Greenlight did a study, a survey. There were of an encampment of 50 people, half of those people had vouchers but cannot find affordable housing to accept those vouchers because affordable housing is scarce in this community. Um, I know we have $5 million allocated with ARPA funds to get some more affordable housing, and hopefully we can work with businesses to parlay that into taking over or revamping a hotel or something so that people have a place to go with their vouchers. But um, Angela from Unity can speak more about the vouchers. If, if you would like to, Angela, come up and talk about the vouchers, housing, and what you all are seeing on the street. Yeah. Ms. Angela, that, thank you, and OPD. Ms. Angela, you can come. Thank you all. Ms. Patterson, you can come in uh, front. Come on. Good afternoon, Ms. Patterson. Good afternoon. I'm Angela us. Patterson. I'm the Deputy Director of Unity of Greater New Orleans, and I supervise the Unity Outreach Team, which consists of four workers who go throughout our New Orleans community and who day and night serve the needs of those persons who are houseless. There is really all kinds of services, all kinds of contacts. I think those of you that I have directly communicated with by email or telephone regarding houseless referrals have been allowed to understand the repeated contacts sometimes that are made by Unity outreach workers and other outreach workers such as Travelers Aid who continuously are visiting people, doing paperwork, applying for housing vouchers and getting approved for housing in lots of cases. However, as has been stated repeatedly by you honored members of the council, affordable housing is the crux, the foundation and the motivator of a lot of the houseless crisis that our community is currently experiencing. 
we get to the point of providing an approval for a houseless person, and then begins the arduous process of looking for an affordable one bedroom housing unit in particular, which is becoming increasingly scarce in our New Orleans community. In addition to that is the terrible fact, but understandable fact sometimes of landlords are not always willing to rent to a formerly houseless person in terms of concern for the safety and well being and continuing rentability of their properties. That's another real challenge in our community. You also, in lots of the cases of formerly unhoused persons, just handing a person a housing voucher doesn't necessarily provide housing stability. You also have to provide services, supportive housing services to have that person that I've heard you council members say need to make daily contact sometimes, regular consistent contact to make sure that whatever challenges are being experienced by that newly housed person are being dealt with effectively and doesn't result in the person leaving their housing or deciding to give it up. So it is very complex and it is being dealt with as effectively as the agencies can, in particular Unity of Greater New Orleans, but it is a multidisciplinary issue. And we're very, very interested and always have been with being as collaborative as we can be in order to solve the problem. Ms. Pat Ms. Patterson, thank you for that. What, what do you do and what do you say like the situation in Bywater, where the individuals, the man and the woman from Mississippi just didn't want help. They didn't want to leave. Now the families in that area had to live with that. Councilman King, lots of times I directly contact the person who makes the referral. I call the homeowner. I call the citizen. I talk to them about what times are they seeing the person homeless in their neighborhoods. Lots of times, even though outreach is making contacts morning, afternoon, evenings, and night, you don't necessarily meet the people who are staying in the properties or on the campsites. So you need to know specific times when the people are available. In addition to that, as in the Murray Street situation, when people are refusing housing and refusing homeless services, which is their right, Unity or no other agency, nonprofit agency, which serves the public can force services on an individual. What we do is try to motivate that person, that couple by continuing contacts to decide that the best option for themselves is to move from that location on the street and to avail themselves of shelter and or housing. Lots of times when people have decided adamantly that they will not go into any type of shelter, you can motivate people with housing. But again, the affordable housing crisis means that you don't necessarily have a housing opportunity to provide for someone. But we would continue to make contacts, continue to try to engage, continue to make relationship kinds of developments until, and in many times this happens, the person decides, I'm going to try that. It's a leap of faith for some folks who have been on the street a long time. I, I understand that and I, I agree with you. My, my question is and my concerns are, after, after all that, we do the outreach and the individuals still say, I'm not leaving. I have, have had people tell me, I prefer to live outside. I prefer to live like this. And they don't, they, they're not residents of the city. People come from all over the country, I guess the warm weather, I guess mm -hmm. the festivities, and they decide that underneath the Claiborne overpass on Calliope on Chapatulas is where they want to live. 
and quite frankly, that's that's just not fair to the people. I know it's not your your issue, mm-hmm. your fault, but it's not fair to the people that live and have businesses along those corridors. I hear you, Councilman King. The only thing I can say is that I would imagine New Orleanians travel also and wind up in other states and other cities and have similar types of participatory behaviors. It is indeed a challenge. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Councilman Harris. Uh, Angela, can you talk about the federal grant that you all applied for? And I know you didn't get it, but more importantly, the partnerships that people from the community, uh, profits from the community came out and said that they would donate in kind and what we're doing about those partnerships. Because even though the grant we didn't get, you know, they didn't get, those partnerships or potential partnerships still exist. Is that correct? Yes. In fact, unfortunately, Martha Cagle would be better able to comment upon that because she spearheaded it and attorney Bill Hines and others who were very, very involved, including yourself and other council people. It was a tremendous outpouring of participation and engagement, excuse me, and really will be kept for thousands of dollars to be put forward or for medical services to be put forward in terms of a overall package to provide housing and services to the unsheltered, the unhoused in our community, which would have essentially covered all the other homeless people, houseless people, whatever is the terminology, they're people without a roof over their heads that this grant, which we did not get for $5 million over a three-year period, would have embraced all of those possibilities, but the dream has not been left behind. And all of you, including yourself, other council people, business partners, uh, medical establishments in our community are still totally engaged with coming up with an alternative plan which will provide these opportunities. And with any additional funding that we can receive, we can still do the work that needs to be done to end homelessness in our community. I wanna say that uh, Judge Johnson was part of that effort as well, Judge Calvin Johnson, who has been working on this issue for some time. But what I wanna amplify and what you're saying is that there are private entities, uh, nonprofits who really came together to put this grant together that we didn't get the grant application, but who are still promising the services that they said they would donate um, as in-kind services. So I just want folks to know that we're not just talking about this, we're actually doing uh, things with other people who are very much concerned with this issue. I think it's on everybody's mind because it is so visible because we see people um, who are not only houseless hurting, but people who are living around or, or have businesses around also hurting. And so this is a good example of trying to build a coalition of people to come together to do something. Um, and I'm hopeful that this embedded position can really take the lead on that and getting the silos worked out. We we're all looking forward to that happening. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Uh, that's, that's, all. Thank you. that's all we have for, for you today. Uh, next we'll do the public comment portion of the meeting. First is Ms. Ecclesiastes. Good afternoon. I'm Asali Devon Ecclesiastes. I'm the CEO of the Ashe Cultural Arts Center. Um, we are the co-producers along with Ujima EDC and Tambourine and Fan. Um, for Carnival, which happens under the bridge at Orleans and Claiborne every year. Okay, two minutes. Um, as a member of a marginalized and displaced community, it is not our desire or intent to marginalize and displace others. However, we do not agree with having our sacred community traditions placed in harm's way um, by the encampments that are under the bridge. Um, at Orleans and Claiborne, all the way down to Esplanade and then some into people's businesses and backyards. Um, this happened because of the fencing that was put up at Canal Street. Um, the JUA that exists between the city and the state 
um, allows the city to be a complainant for removal. The um, land is actually owned by the city. The structure itself is owned by the state, but the city owns the land and is party to a JUA, with, which would allow them to be the complainant and have those things removed. We're asking for a humane, equitable, short-term solution, including temporary storage um, and whatever else you might need to do before carnival so that the community space is honored and we are able to have our celebrations in the dignified way in which we deserve to. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Williams, is that correct? Reverend, Reverend Dr. Is Deborah Williams? Okay. Good afternoon. And thank you, council members, for being present and giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Upper Night Ward. Um, I live in the 1600 block of France Street, which is adjacent to the 4200 block of North Claiborne. And now we are beginning to get an encampment. And being present, listening at Council Member King, I see where. What I wanted to present is an issue because of is an encampment that has uh, presented itself in a vacant lot. And possibly maybe a letter or so could go out to that um, vacant lot owner to see what's happening because we have several lots in our area that belong to people that live in Slidell in other commuting areas, and they may not be aware. Also, on France Street in the 1600 block, we have an abandoned truck that has been wrecked, that's covered with the blue roof and chairs for protection, along with tires all over the two vacant lots. And it's growing uh, and breathing uh, rodents, and our neighborhood is infested with big rats, big as a size 11, 12 shoe foot, and mice like a whole community. And the neighbors are really complaining because we spending our retirement money on buying poison. And we do contact the rodent department here, but they're not, uh, coming out, you know, regular enough. I don't feel that we have to tell them every week we got a problem where these um, rodents just come out the drains and walk the neighborhoods during the daytime. And that's very scary. And I also want to say, I practice in Christ homeless ministry and everything you've addressed, the homeless that uh, I'm exposed to, and Reverend Bell, one of my assistants, they refuse to have us assist them to get placed because they feel that we bring them everything they need. They have it all. And if they give that up, they have to give up their habits within these facilities. So there's a lot going on with addictions and also mental health. Thank you, thank you, Reverend. Plus, they have infection with sores and so forth. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Next, we have Reverend Richard Bell. Good afternoon, City Council. I'm Reverend Richard Bell, the L9 chairperson for A Community Verse, also the chairperson for St. Kofa, uh, also on the committee for Main Street. Um, as we go into this physical year with Main Street to build a corner up on St. Claude Street. The graffiti is so bad that as the people paint their building, the graffiti come back up. I ride through the neighborhood at night. They have cleaned up two row street, I mean, um, two, um, chop, I mean, Tupelo and St. Claude and Claiborne been cleaned up pretty much, but we don't have patrol. I'm also on the, um, the 5th District Police Advisor Committee Board. We trying to get the police to patrol the area. I even say, if you're gonna patrol the area, blow your horn, cause I have a cam outside my house that help a lot of time with activity. 
to let me know you're patrolling the area. We try to patrol at night to see what's really going on. We have shooting going on on Tupelo Street and Claiborne and St. Claude been going for the last three months that you don't know if bullets coming in your house or not. Main Street building up to St. Claude Corner. We about to open up the French market. The problem is that as you build these new facilities, if you don't get the graffiti line up, they're gonna start building, putting the stuff all over the new building. So we're trying to build up the L9, but how can you build it up if you don't have patrol and the people council is vandalizing the building, putting ties. I get called with trailers poke over on the other side that people come in the area. We they got cameras up, but my problem is anybody maintaining those cameras because they're still dumping stuff all over there. So how can we move up from Katrina if we don't have the police patrolling? Uh, we patrolling at night, and I'm taking taking notes on what I'm finding and reporting to the 311 to 611. So oh, the, the problem is that as long as you don't get the graffiti under control, it don't make sense for Main Street spending all this money on St. Claude Street with St. Colfer to build up that corner and you're tearing the buildings down. Right now with the French market coming up, we have fence around it, but that's not gonna hold them back and they wanna put that graffiti over there with. Thank, Thank you, Pastor Bell. And I just wanna be fair, I don't wanna paint the picture that the unhoused are doing the dumping of tires and abandoned vehicles and graffiti. I don't, I want that to be said the council is suggesting that. Um, next is Gregory Black. Hello, great people of the council, the great city of New Orleans. Obviously, we got an issue that's bigger than all of us put together. I've been here for five decades. I've seen tremendous change in this city, tremendous growth, tremendous fault, tremendous glory here. It's our jobs. Got a lot of lost people out here that need all of our help, all of our help, all of our wisdom. That's why we're all here. Our homeless, our addiction, our crime problems will not be resolved tonight, tomorrow, before Mardi Gras been with us a long time, but it's gonna take your great leadership, your great understanding to come together, to bring this city back to the greatness that you, it always has been, okay? I've been a lover of this city all my life. Everything has tried to take from me the love of this city away, and it can't. It won't. And I would tell you that there are answers. There are solutions, okay? There are answers and there are solutions. We were all going to have to come together, okay? As one, not divided, not this attitude, this attitude, this person doing this, this person doing this. All of us working together. And unless we all come together, one purpose, one purpose, and that is to solve the issues that we have, which are many, which are very many. It's not an easy task, but we can do this. We're educated people. We're not a third world country. Thank, thank you, Mr. Black. Yes. Dy dynamic city. And I would tell you, Bring our resources together. We can help the homeless. We can help the addicted. We, we can do this as one, not divided all together as one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Black. Thank you for your time. Very well. LaCour, Romy LaCour.
Hello, <clears throat> I'm Romy Lacour, uh, representing Housing NOLA. Lots has been said. Um, we're where we are where we are now because of what we didn't do before. We didn't make the investments that we needed to and we didn't make the investments that we did in the right way. Um, so 20 years ago, we had a task force of sorts uh, to talk about the housing issue and whatever happened didn't produce the results we need to prevent today. Um, I know everybody had great intentions. Um, and then Katrina happened and we got billions of dollars. And one of those investments was the road home program, which ended up giving money to people based on how much their house was worth before the storm, which means the money that was given to people didn't give them enough to make their house resilient for the future, which brings up how much of our housing stock is deteriorating and much of it needs rehab that even what we do have needs to be made better to actually be fit for living in a lot of the time. So I don't know what we're gonna do about this Mardi Gras situation, uh, but it's important to treat people with dignity even when the whole world tries to take their humanity away. So as far as long-term solutions, I implore you to invest way more money in housing, rehab, and new developments. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Black. I'm Kevin Sloan Oakbinder. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for making a space for us to be able to speak about this. And this is a, a poem that I wrote that speaks to what many people have said about the lack of follow through that happens. The way it's been is not how it has to be. Just because a person is psychotic, schizophrenic, has bipolar disorder, doesn't mean they're not racist grew up in a white supremacist system like we all did. The ideal identity, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, drilled into consciousness the moment we draw breath. The drilling only undone by conscious intention, ongoing analysis and correction of thoughts, patterned on maintaining systems that oppress us all except a few. Those who make oppression into institution, those who hold purses that string together people like they were commodities. The monster of madness is not the only monster here. The monster of madness is not the only monster that sits on cement, lingers in doorways, and at the edges of a life that could be, if only with medication. It is a bigger monster made of loathing and fear filled with contempt, fed by centuries of atrocities committed in the name of being righteous. Punish the poor for their poverty. Don't cause a fuss lest you be labeled troublemaker or worse, murdered for your efforts to bring people together. The trajectory of history is full of examples. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Viola Louisa, Malcolm X, Cheney, Goodman, Schwerner, Harry and Harriet Moore. Massacres committed on Easter and Christmas, like the one in Colfax, Louisiana, or on Sundays, like the one at 16th Street Baptist Church. So much spilled blood rife with no justice. The historical trajectory of travesties, perverse, pervasive, and poisonous crammed with counterintelligence and acrimony, the dead call to us, the living, call for reckoning, to see with other than our eyes, to look from the place inside that makes us human, to rise above ways things have often been done, to be more finer versions of ourselves. As we seek to see and to listen, using justice, equity, and compassion as remedy, 
the dead ask this of us. Will we listen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Derek Walker. Okay, okay. Bill Thompson. Good afternoon, Council. Two and a half years ago, I started an organization called the Paint the Block Challenge. Some of you know of our work. We've been all over New Orleans cleaning up. To date, we've cleaned up 55 blocks around the city. We painted houses, we fixed roofs, we've um, painted fences, we've cleaned up lots. So I'm listening to your, what you're talking about, the problems here is housing, light. <clears throat> There's a lot of housing in the city that's available right now. We spent Saturday cleaning up an apartment complex uh, that's one of a couple within a block that's almost a thousand units that's vacant. There's people living in this place. It's a mess. We went in and cleaned it up. We normally come in with our one of our partners or multiple partners, which one of them is Odyssey House. They give uh, counseling, they get people in drug alcohol treatment. We clean up, we feed everybody there. They get counseling from our pastors. Um, we do everything to help them out. Now we've, we've uh, miracles have happened. There's, we, we go into the worst areas of the city. And I guarantee you, we've been in at least one of your areas, if not multiple, multiple times. And uh, I think a couple of you know me, a couple of you I've tried to get a hold of that I'm not getting a return call on. But the solution is there's a couple thousand easily uh, vacant apartments, complexes around this city. And most, a lot of them are owned by one person. And uh, we've gone in and cleaned up a couple. We've cleaned up the streets multiple times. We've gone in and chased out drug dealers. Uh, we went into uh, uh, one ward three times and drug dealers finally left. The people took over their, their, their blocks again. So we've had as many as a couple hundred volunteers. It's a volunteer outfit. Uh, last Saturday, we had people come all the way from Alabama to help us out. Two paint the blocks ago, we had people come in from Texas, Illinois, New Mexico. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers come in, plus the people from the community. We've got a ground roots movement that has been growing uh, by leaps and bounds. And uh, I know personally, I've got 27 people into a drug alcohol treatment program. So the solution that's, is- That's the time, Mr. Thompson. You can finish your comment. Okay, the solution is to clean up the units that are out there now that are blighted, that people are actually living in. And number two is, I invite any of you to call me. I'll give you my number right now, 504-676-7512. We'll come in your district, we'll clean up, we'll paint, we'll, uh, we'll save people, we'll get them into treatment. And as more and more people grow, we're gonna take this city back over, but we are doing it. We've been doing this two and a half years now. We have a track record. So thank you for your time. What was your number again? 504-676-7512. Call me anytime. And, thank and, you. And, and just, they've been very active uh, um, already in Gentilly area, St. Rock, uh, parts of the community, and with uh, Pastor Rebirth and, and and uh, one accord, uh, thank you guys for the work from giving out food to uh, fixing and repairing housing from seniors that have been extremely active. And I thank wanna, you. I believe you were in Algiers this, this past weekend. Yes. Correct. Thank you. I believe you came there a couple of times. The, the property you're talking about, owned by the same owner, is under litigation, and it's, it's been a big mess for a long time. But I agree, that property and others surrounding that area has hundreds not thousands of, of empty units available. Federal City, uh, McGall Manor, Austin vacant. 
just as one other comment, I started in the eighties in Oakland, cleaning up properly properties and, and taking the tenants and putting them to work. And we saw that on Saturday, the tenants came out of their places. They've got rats the size of cats in there. I mean, and they came out and they helped us and we hauled all sorts of garbage away. We fed them, they thanked us. This is what we need to do. We're proactive. Okay, your other major problem is code enforcement. It is non-existent, folks. I looked this morning you, and I took 15 minutes. You got over a thousand properties I saw just in the 15 minutes that are scheduled for demolition. Really? I've called, I've, I've wrote letters on dozens of properties. Nothing has happened. If we don't get proactive, we're never gonna clean up this city. People gotta know we're serious. And the fines are, they're peanuts. People don't, you know, it's not gonna do anything. If you increase the fines and gave us a, a dumpster budget, we'll do incredible things in the next year. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. I just wanna take an opportunity, however, to defend code enforcement. It's an overwhelming, you just mentioned thousands. At the end of the day, to tear down a house is so difficult and somebody doesn't want you to tear down their property. You have to have multiple hearings, you have to take them to court. You have to bid the job because we're a public agency. You have to get the lowest bid. You have to share it up. Or, in, For example, in our district in the year, we've gotten about 50 properties torn down. That's hard as heck. Now, code enforcement, I'm going to encourage everyone out there to recognize that we sure could use a whole lot more inspectors, and there were vacancies in that area. I want people to fill those areas because, honestly, I'm amazed sometimes at what code enforcement does do with its limited resources in terms of personnel and just the overwhelming number, everything from individual apartments to houses and the like. But I look forward to working with you. I'm sure that we can work together. I am interested in your solution to what is on the agenda today, which is an issue of house of situations where there are unhoused people who are in unhealthy situations and also need assistance in a variety of ways. That's unacceptable. If you can help with that, I'd appreciate it. But I'll talk to you afterwards. I'll I could show you pictures a lot worse than that. I got oh, on my phone. Well, you don't even have to send me a picture yeah. first in that one. Here's one right here. I look forward to We're it. here ready to work. I'm going to call we you. We want to team up with you. Anything you, you need, we'll do it. After Thank you. Meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Gregory Hall, followed by J.C. Sanders. So Gregory Hall, then J.C. Sanders. Good evening. My name is Gregory Hall. Uh, I've been in the road home, small rental property program now for um, maybe 15, 16 years. Uh, I have documents here. I was told in 2011 that my property was in a number of properties to be rebuilt. I haven't received anything from the uh, federal funded small rental property program. I'm asking the whole council, not just one person. I want y'all as a a council to contact Louisiana governor, find out what can be done about this. I believe this information with y'all because code enforcement charged me $500 a day in fines. So I don't need one poison. Councilman Green, I tried to leave this with your assistant. You can leave it with me now, but I do not have jurisdiction over the state or federal government's rental property. Right, but we had meetings right here in this council. You said, well, but I'm, you only use this building. I do not have jurisdiction over the state of feds, and I encourage you to use the assistance of an attorney to represent your interests. Oh, that's, okay, that's what you're telling me, that you get an attorney? Oh, well, Mr. Hall, Mr. There Hall. There are free attorneys. New Orleans Legal Assistance Corporation. We'll talk. No, about I went, I've been over there already. Well, then, then I mean, very honestly, well, speak well, Mr. Hall, let me ask you: Have you speak to who? You might also want to contact your state elected officials, state reps, state senators, and also the council, uh, congressmen, your your neighborhood. State Councilmember uh, Green is going to J. C. Sanders. Hello to the councilman. Uh, I don't have to say what a disgrace this is with the homeless under the overpass and the bridges. But I've been here sitting and listening and I haven't heard a solution yet. 
Well, try this. Why don't you get with the mayor and ask her to propose a dissent decree? You, the body, the governing body, agree with it, carry it before a judge, and see whether he approve of it. Not only that, you can't carry this before a judge and want him to approve of something and you don't have no, no place or no money for the homeless under the bridge. You gotta have a plan. What kind of plan does the city have? Do the law, where's the health department? Do you have a health department? Yes. Not yes. pretty. Yes, yes, we do. But what, what do they do? I mean, these are these people are sleeping in and in, in their urine and feces. They got roaches, rats, and ro rodents within. I mean, they have made it to the French quarters all over the place. These people think that they are five and ten blocks away, that this is not gonna affect them. It is. They ride past the homeless every day, go up to their office and think that this is not gonna affect them. This is ridiculous. Now, in the city council, y'all, the government body, y'all need to have a solution. But what I've been hearing is I'm bogged down with all kinds of Napoleonic laws, rules, and regulations. Come on, work on a solution. Talk to the mayor. Where is the city attorney? Is he president? Um, she is not president, though. And these are the city attorney. So you guys got to work together and come up with a solution. Not that I'm bogged down with this ordinance. What about the Build Back Better money? Do y'all have a, a apartment that working on getting this funds for police officers and other city uh, agency? Do you do you do you have anybody working? specifically on how to get this one, some of this $1.57 trillion. Mr. Sanders, yes. So that's what the embedded person will do. The embedded person who starts on Ash Wednesday, they will look at federal funding and other state sources for funding. We also have $5 million from ARPA money to hopefully create additional affordable housing. $5 million is not going to be enough, but we're going to have to partner so what with is other public-private partnerships. Not for good, y'all, but the rats and the rodents and the people live living the, and sleeping in their feces. The health, the health department conducts monthly clean, weekly cleanups of the encampments, but they rotate around. All eighty it, y'all can get together with the mayor. You need to work on this. Oh, we are working on it. We are working on it, and we Let's have it with solutions. We're trying. Thank sir. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very welcome, Ms. Sue Press. Take your time, Ms. Press. You ain't got to. You ain't got to run, take your time. My name is Sue Press, um, 1830 Dumain Street, um, part of block off of Claybone. Uh, I represent Association for Better Communities and also Old and New Star Fellows, Associating Pleasure Club. I'm deeply rooted within the Trimay community. My grandmother raised eight kids in the Trimay. My mother raised 12. So we're really involved in our community and we have a love for our community. Uh, we do, as a family, functions under the bridge like Juneteenth, um, Black Lives Matter signs, uh, hanging for the parade, we utilize under the bridge. We are so deeply rooted in our community that the organization, my family and I, we do book sack drives, real heavy, 300, 400 book sack, coat drives. We do block by block cleanup. Um, so when the homeless, we see the homeless, so we had to get involved with the homeless. Okay, we got to do something with the homeless. We went from Canal Street, and we got close every other week or week. We had to feed the homeless. And we got to St. Philip and Claiborne, Dumain and Claiborne, and we had my nieces and my nephews and everything. We out there feeding the homeless. But we what we found was drugs, needles, all this. How could you teach children how to give in a community or be part of the community or raise them when, you know, we trying to do good within the community. And here we see needles. I know being homeless is not a crime. It's not a crime, but I do know it should not be all that drug 
going on underneath the bridge. It's, it should not be that because they have families that utilize underneath the bridge for family functions, kids and so forth like that. You have people with businesses and so forth. And I can feel for Louis, you know, for the funeral home. But my thing is that um, something I keep on telling me that, you know, I know home is not a, a crime. I'm a builder. Homeless is not a crime, but there's something, it's something our city can do to better this, this look. You know, it's in our community. I go to our own property within a, in a trim area. They come in my yard. They take stuff out my yard. You know, people, they drugs all over, you know, and you have to be, I have a, you know, I have children. I have nieces and things. You, you're afraid. You're afraid in your own community because of the outcome that they come from everywhere and come from under the bridge and they walk in our community. And you have to worry about things like that. And I, one thing I wanted to ask was, okay, right, so I wanted to ask. Oh, are there programs before people become homeless? Can y'all send some resource out, something like that? Put that out. Another thing, are there incentives for people like me? I know there are incentives for developers, but I also acquire property that I would like to develop to help with the homeless, um, build some affordable houses, really build, not what they claim they're building because the only thing in our neighborhood is, okay, only thing in our neighborhood is, um, only thing in our neighborhood right now is Airbnb, short-term rental and all like this. It's not, stop that with that affordable homes. It's not, it's not affordable because no one can come live in a trimmy area that's been there all their life and would love to come back. But I do have some property that I would like to develop for affordable. And if y'all can guide me or give me some type of senator, or give me some resource where, oh, okay, we can, this can help you along to get a developer for the help. Thank you. Affordable housing. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Press. There's somebody from Councilman Harris' office gonna, gonna come talk to you. Ms. Sheila Delaney. Hi, thank you for um, holding this. Some of you know me, I work for Zach Smith, but I'm not being paid to be here. He's uh, graciously letting me to interrupt my work day. I live in Treme, I live two blocks from Claiborne. I'm really here to say that this is an incredibly complicated and difficult problem. And I just wanna offer some thoughts and offer my help. I'm meeting with council member Harris shortly. To council member Thomas's point, I really want people to hear this. It's easy to confuse the cause of homelessness and blame it on addiction and mental health issues. If this were the case, West Virginia, that has an exponential opioid crisis compared to most other states, should be burdened by homelessness, but it isn't because housing is still affordable there. To Councilmember Green and Councilmember Thomas's points, and all of you I know understand this, encampments have negative impacts for everyone, for those who live in them and those who live near them and try to do business near them. And you all know it's incumbent on us to actually invest in solutions. Um, I'm from Minneapolis. I'm not saying Minneapolis does this better by any stretch of the imagination, but I wanna share a few things that have worked that we could get to work on now. Uh, what has worked is just what Council Member Moreno described. You can try to reach people with intermittent contact as much as you want. Overall, it just isn't as effective as having sustained contact. And what we did in Minneapolis, in one example, we've done this several times, we had an encampment that had been present for a year. It was deemed uh, service resistant. And I just wanna make a comment about that idea of service resistance. I understand where it comes from, but in general, I don't believe in it. What it is, is it's uh, people who are resistant to services have had negative experiences. They have a reason for their reaction. And what we did in Minneapolis, we've done this several times, but particularly in this encampment that was deemed so unsafe, real or imagined, that service providers were prohibited from being there. We came with a service tent that literally brought every service people needed to the encampment, and we stayed there for four hours a day for 10 days. And so it gave people an opportunity to get used to us, to get used to the providers. The other thing we did that was so helpful is we had a culturally specific hospitality provider in Minneapolis. Minneapolis has a team of, they're called violence interrupters. So they were among those teams. And what they did is they made it, you know, they made it uh, something that felt like uh, people cared about them. There was food and resources, but mostly it was simply that those caseworkers were there. People got used to them. They started to interact. And that encampment that at the time there were 24 people, that was September of 2021. 
by December 1st, all but two of those people were housed. It works. And then the other thing is people have legitimate objections to shelter. And so what we can do and what you have done, you have a low barrier shelter, but I'm going to be sharing with Councilmember Harris how we created a shelter that was literally based on the objections people had to coming inside. And it's working. It's had a wait list since December 2021. And I'm I'm here to offer any help I can. Um, I, I, for example, there was a woman in the, the encampment I just described who had been outside for seven years and she absolutely swore she would never, ever be housed. She's been housed for two years and it's because she became used to the providers. I don't agree that encampments should be a, allowed to just impact businesses and impact residents and cause a lot of pain for everyone. But, you know, the, the, the situation is that we have to acknowledge that if you're if we are a society that allows people to be unhoused, that in itself is a immoral premise. And so from there, all sorts of pain ensues. And I just think I think you are doing some great things and I'm here to offer any other help and thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Ms. Delaney, thank you for your comments. Um, I'd, I'd like my chief of staff to get your contact information because I definitely would like to have a follow-up meeting with, and maybe I could just join Council Member Harris in this meeting. Thank you. Ms. Ramsey, Nari Ramsey, while she's coming up, I just received a text, a, a suggestion, maybe every, every church that's um, in the city will adopt a unhoused person and work with that person tirelessly to get them off the street. That was just one suggestion that came through from constituent about how to resolve this issue or help resolve this issue. Ms. Ramsey. Good afternoon. Um, first and foremost, thank you all for holding this joint meeting. It is a quality of life issue and it is a community development issue. Also wanna thank the people who came up beforehand and offered solutions. And I would be remiss if I did not first things first, what we heard back in community is if you all can have meetings where community people can actually come, right? So that's the first ask, that the next quality of life and community development meeting be held in a time and location where more of the community can attend. So that's the first task. The second task is to say that you all already know New Orleans hosts the greatest free show on earth. So coordination is not really our issue, right? So thank you, Ms. Leslie Harris, for recognizing the need to have someone now be in charge of how we coordinate all of these um, very special needs for the houseless population. So coordination is not really the issue. We're going to get there. But what we know is that community has come up with a wonderful idea of how we can manage the problem, and that's by what? Programming the space, right? And so again, someone else used the word persistence. So I'm being persistent to remind you all that we have an idea of what needs to happen because it just being a parking lot is not enough and it doesn't bring resources to our communities. The other thing we all talked about urgency and someone said, oh, well, when the sidewalk stepper said there was an incident, okay, but there's tension if I have to deal with something that I'm not familiar with and now there's a dog barking at me under the bridge. Running at you. Running at me. There's people now being violent towards me in this space that's supposed to be family friendly and has been for so many years. So this sense of urgency is very much real. So thank you for using that word. We talked also about the health department being involved and I do applaud them as I do the sanitation department for doing what they can do. But again, it is a housing issue that must be addressed. But please, please, please understand that this sense of urgency is because it is a health crisis at this point. How many more people have to talk about the rodents or the feces or anything else that's now violence towards us and our quality of life? So don't let that word urgency go very lightly. It is urgent. And someone else talked about you all getting with the mayor and whomever else. Well, guess what? Declare a state of emergency. Because that's really what it is. And we know that our community deserves better. And we know that we all can do better. So thank you again for having this meeting. We look forward to community being invited to the next meeting that's at a time where we all can come. All right. Thank you. all Thank you, Ms. Ramsey. Thank you. Next, we have so you self, coach. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I really don't know what to say. So much has been said and so much have not been said. And the first thing I will say is this, I came to a meeting 
Well, it's going to be speaking, I think, to interested council members so we can solve this problem, this great problem that we have, not only here in New Orleans, but all over the world. I, only, I, only, I don't see too many council members. And it seems though every time I come to a council meeting, somebody is absent. Well, we can never solve the problem like that. When you have a problem that's so large as this, everybody got to put their shoulders to the grindstone if you're serious about this. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of work. The job that you hold up here, council member, is such an important job. You just don't know. You're not going to get a tremendous amount of money if you plan on getting rich unless you plan on doing something. You don't have no business. But you can help a whole lot of people. I can tell you that. That's my field of work. I'm a servant. I'm an 80 year old servant, servant of this life. Having been a teacher for 35 years, a coach for 55 years, all in all in all, the community activists, work with Dr. Martin Luther King, all these great people in the community here that you see trying to get the job done. But you have to be serious about this. From what I hear, I hear more rights being done <laughs> uh, for the people who shouldn't have these rights. If you don't vote, if you don't pay taxes, if you're not inoculated against real serious diseases and try to help out the communities, what great citizenship do you have? And what about us, might I ask? They remind me of Fannie Lou Hammer, you know? What about us? What about us? I've lived in that community for over 30 years. I'm more at stake than anybody in here. I own that almost that whole 1100 block of Claiborne. Eight different lives. I've invested a lot of money trying to make that community what it should be. But how can I invest these millions of dollars with these people coming in my yard, defecating, urinating on my porch in my alley? I spent two stints of at least five, uh, six, seven days at a time in the hospital with COVID from being in this area. You look at the Cleveland show. They were building the show back. And they tell me the people they didn't even have point bits. It looked like a circle. But that guy to say all those bikes, none of them are stolen, none of them are probably stolen. Man, I got about 600 bikes out there. What kind of job are you doing as the police if you say none of those bikes are stolen? But we can't kick the ball in it. That. It's a multi layered problem. Hmm? Okay. Housing. Coach, when you start to wrap your comments up. Uh, I'm sorry, man. I, when I saw talking like this, I, I saw this religion, you know. But it, it, it's just a shame we have to go through this. And to you, Councilman, thank you for being here. But I also tell you, partners, man, it looks bad for the city with just some of y'all here. And a multi-layer problem like we have in Mardi Gras coming up, which I don't care that much about Mardi Gras, you know, because it's a bigger problem than Mardi Gras. Thank you, Coach. You got enough clowns already. Thank you. And and you 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 stated the words us and 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 we and look, we, we're all in one community, but I think on, until the city gets a sense of urgency with this issue and really starts to, like you say, put your nose to the grindstone, it will divide the community between us and them and we. Um, we all live in this one city together, but we we definitely need for some 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 work to start happening and needed soon. Mardi Gras is a week away. And as stated earlier, the, the Indians and the and the um, cross bone, cross skulls, am I saying that right? Skull and bones, I'm sorry. Skull and bones, they won't be able to, to, to mask and do their routine they've been doing for decades comfortably under the Claiborne overpass because of the tents and the needles and the, the dogs and the chairs and so forth and so on. All right, uh, so I will ask one more call being filled out. Mr. Louis Charbonnet. Members of the council, I, I really, I'm, I was hesitant to come here today. 
because I keep saying the same thing. But you know, about six months ago, I came and I said there was a small problem about homeless people coming to Treme. I don't know how many of you passed that, but I, I beg of you, I beg of you, get in your car, drive down Claiborne Avenue between Canal and Esplanade or either St. Bernard. And if you know anything about that community, you will be ashamed and hurt. Sometimes I cry. But the fact is, I can't walk out of my door without being accosted by somebody homeless. Now, I listen at the police, and, and God bless the police. We need them. I know they work in shorthand, but they said they have no record of any violence or anything else that happens in that area. Well, let me say this. I got accosted walking out my front door by a homeless person. Scared the hell out of me. If I would have been, had enough reflex at my age to pull the door closed, I don't know what would have happened to me. It took me 12 hours for the police to come for me to write a report, but I wanted to report it. That was about two months ago. About two weeks ago, maybe 10 days, I've never heard of a funeral home being broken into except one time before during the, during the times when they were making clickums. <laughs> Some people broke through a window and went to the bottom room. Well, last week or 10 days ago, guess what? My funeral home was broken into. What they stole was embalming fluid. Things that they could use, rugs, carpets that we use in the hearse to keep the floors from getting scored, uh, scratched up, towels, sheets. I, I just don't know what else to say to you all. And I understand about their rights. And I asked, I asked, uh, and I, I tried to wait to be the last person to talk because I don't want to go off as well, went off last time. And I want to apologize to you all the last time I was here. I did go off and I, and I shouldn't have. But the fact is we are hurting in Treme. Historically, Treme is the oldest black neighborhood in the country. We got ravished with, with Armstrong Park. We got ravished with the interstate. And now we're getting ravaged with the homeless. Now, I don't have anything against people. It's not our fault. It's not your fault. It was the people who were in office before, like Bobby Jendall, who closed all the medical health clinics in the state of Louisiana. We talk about housing. There are beautiful houses in Tremaine now. Beautiful houses that were beautiful houses before when black craftsmen built those houses. But now they're beautiful houses because people from out of town own them. And when somebody who tries to move into that community, they got to have $1,500, $2,000 for a two bedroom house. So how can somebody who works in the tourist industry here, which is the only thing we have, making almost less than minimum wages, afford to rent those houses? There has to be a solution and you all have to find it. You all have to find it. The city council has to find it, not us, not me. You know, we talk about it's the state property. It is the state's property. I have some proposals sitting on my desk and I'm reluctant to deal with them. The state says, Lewis, if you want to, if you want to control that land, lease it. Why should I have to lease a piece of property under the interstate and pay hundreds of dollars a month to protect it and clean it when the homeless people are living there for nothing? Two weeks ago, I went to something in the morning. I, 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 was, I was shocked. There must have been front end loaders, sanitation trucks, police department, health department, Everybody out there. I said, oh man, they're gonna do something about the homeless. Well, what they did was they cleaned up one side of the street, the homeless moved to that side of the street under the bridge and they cleaned up the side that they were on and they came back over there. If you look at Cleveland Street now, Freddie, you've been there before, Eugene, you've been there. It is almost triple the size of what's going on there. We have, <clears throat> In the next few days, Mardi Gras here. Now, I'm not a big Mardi Gras person. I try to get away from Mardi Gras because I live right there. I mean, I can, I've seen all the Indians in the world I want to see and everything else that happens. But we have other people who are coming to our area. It is disgraceful to invite people to your house and you don't clean up. Now, I'm asking 
any of the powers that be, you all, sanitation, unity, police department, at least come clean your front door. Because between Orleans and Esplanade Avenue, there will be more black people crowding in that area than St. Charles Avenue. And it's a disgrace. There are needles all over the ground. People have buckets of human waste. The odor is horrendous. And Eugene, yes, that area you show between the two, between the two interstates, if you put that up. No. Why should I pay hundreds of dollars to put up an illegal fence? And I know it's illegal. I know it's illegal. That picture there. Now I put up an eight foot fence right across there between those two down ramps. That area is so smelly. I mean, when people come to visit my funeral home, they, they don't even park down in that area anymore. Everybody's trying to get up to the front, but now the front is getting crowded because the people have moved the whole camp, camp all the way down to St. Philip Street. It's solid. Not only on one side this time, Freddie, but both sides. Eugene, you need to, you passed that a day, you say. Well, both sides of the, under the interstate. And now, I took a few pictures before I came here today. I, I don't know how to get them to you, but they're not, only, they're not only under the interstate, they're all the way out to the curve now with trash. I mean, right along the curve, you, you drive your car, you stick your arm out, you can knock the stuff down. It's getting horrible. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. It's, it, and, and, and we as a city, as a, as a people, and you all as the elected officials for our city who represents us, you all should be hurt too. You should be sad that our beautiful city, and I've lived in Treme for 84 years. Never seen it like this, never. Thank you, Mr. Charbonnet. Thank you. Last, last um, public comment is from Ms. Smith. If, there any, if there's anyone else, please fill, fill the form out. Good afternoon, council members. I'm here today. The quality of life is being compromised all throughout the city. And I'm here today in support of Ashe Culture Arts Center in regards to removing the encampments from underneath the Claiborne Bridge. Not just today, but every day. We knew Mardi Gras was coming last year. And it looks like no one prepared to do anything to remove the mess that's under there now. It's not just there, it's all over the city. And it's, a, and it's an eyesore, and it is an embarrassment to the citizens that live here. So I'm here today. I don't know what you can do to figure it out between now and Mardi Gras, but it would be very wonderful if we could have that area cleaned so that the families and the residents of the city can enjoy Mardi Gras underneath that bridge. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I, I spoke too soon. Ms. Thomas, Thomas Bellas, commenter. I just want to let you all know that our office, along with Council Green's office, we share that clip on overpass. We requested for the city to come out and clean it up. Um, they've come out, but as been stated before, you can't prevent someone from living under the bridge. And when we when it's cleaned up, the encampments come back. And that's just that's that is the the uh the challenging part to figure out how to not have the encampments come back and, and have some permanent solutions for those who, who are in house to get it to get to a safe, clean place to live. And, and that's the that's the impasse we're at right now. Um, but we we are working on this end as a council to keep it clean. Ms. Ms. Thomas. Good afternoon all. <clears throat> Thank you for taking my card late. I was actually on the freeway and I was listening on the radio, but I just had to come here in, in person to try to speak. So I own Treme Market Branch, 800 North Claiborne Avenue, and I am between two encampments. So constantly all day long, I get the privilege of seeing people walking back and forth, people I'm afraid of, people that come to my establishment. I'm afraid that they're gonna be afraid and not utilize us. These people, some have on shirts, some don't. They, they don't look like somebody that you want walking in the neighborhood. And you know we don't ever talk about, um, like the children of, Tre of, of Treme. So for years, I've always wondered in it, how they crossed Claiborne Avenue with very minimal lights 
and stop signs and got to the schools on both sides without getting run over and killed. So now we've got children that have to go through an encampment or around an encampment or at least see the, the degradation of people that the kids uptown don't even know exists. They go back and forth to school. They come and play in their yards or whatever. They have their play days. They have no idea of what our kids in Treme experience and see on a daily basis. And this homeless issue, it, it, it just needs to have something happen. Um, and I think that it's unfair to citizens to say that we don't know what to do. Because if you leave it up to me, I bet you I could figure out something to do. And you guys have the power. You can legally do things. Mine would be illegal, in the dark, under the table. So the two things that I think about, when we have a great big bucket, and we call it homelessness, unhoused, unhomed, then it does seem too big of a problem to deal with. Let's break out who these people really are. If you have people that want housing, and you pay Unity, and Unity has all these federal dollars, and they have units and, 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 and certificates and all, then put them to work. Not only handing out certificates, but have them hold meetings with homeowners to assure them that these people would be followed by case managers who would come out weekly and make sure that the property is okay. And have the city back it up, saying that, okay, well, if you get a bad one in there and they tear your place up, we'll assure you that we're gonna help you with fixing it. So that'll take care of the people that want housing, right? So now we left with the people that came here and wanna just use drugs and that's not interested in participating as being a citizen in the city of New Orleans. And I'm sure that there's some laws or something that can, can deal with them, whether it's having a, a dog that's unregistered, using drugs publicly, pouring pee and poo out on the sidewalk. There's things that can be done and I'm not looking to put people in jail. I'm looking to have people conform. You know, I was sitting over here on the end and there was a man there that you spoke to Councilman Green who was practically uh, what I could hear of the conversation, begging for assistance, begging for help and is unsure and is all tangled up in this whole big conglomerate of what you do to save your property. So you have people like that that paid their taxes and trying to participate. And then you have these people under the bridge with the dogs and the blankets and the half bikes and all of that, that we're saying, well, you know, we don't know what to do with them. If a person was walking along the street bleeding, we wouldn't say, well, you know, he's bleeding. We don't know what to do. The people that have true mental health issues, they need to, they need help. So it's not enough that Bobby Jindal closed the mental health facilities 20 years ago. We need to open them up and get those people in the housing. So now we've dealt with two parts of the population of homelessness, three. So we got the mental health, we got the people that want housing, and then we got the people that just don't care and don't want housing. So that's what I'm here to express and ask you guys for help with. It's not just, if we keep talking about the, house, the, the housing crisis and the homelessness, then we're not going to get anywhere. And then one last thing, and then I'm gone. The, um, I was appalled, and I guess it's been about five years ago when the American Cans, um, <clears throat> the grants that they had been given, sunset. And all the poor people who could maybe have afforded something five years ago, they were set out on the street or whatever to face the, prop the new property rents and values and stuff. So quit giving these developers all of these tax breaks for things that are going to sunset in five and 10 years. There should be no sunset. Either you're doing affordable housing or you're not. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a couple of comments from the Dez. Before that, I want to thank you for highlighting the fact that the children of Jamea had to walk across in those encampments, how unsafe that could be. So hopefully that sets a fire underneath the sense of urgency um, with those administration that may be listening, that we need something done. Because the moment something happens to a child, then it's going to be time to scramble and figure out who was at fault. But let's try to prevent that before we get to that point. Not just a child, uh, anyone for that matter. Councilman Green. Just general comments. Um, first, I certainly appreciate everyone who's here and everyone who was here earlier. And I just want to confirm that we hear your concerns. I'll give you the sense of urgency. Outside of Hunter's Field, you cannot go much more than 10 feet before you see pink needles 
And if children are playing at Hunter's Field and their ball goes beyond Hunter's Field by 10 feet, you get to the point where you're near a homeless encampment and you're near needles. I'll tell you, I'm very concerned, very urgent um, consideration that's being given to this issue. This meeting doesn't necessarily solve it and it's not designed to do it, but it's important for the public to recognize that yes, there are constraints on what you can do. The United States Supreme Court has ruled that it's not a crime to be homeless. So you are not picking up anyone who is homeless and bringing them to jail. And if you do, they'll be there for a day and they'll be right back. We know that we have an issue with regards to home affordability. And in this room, I can tell you, we all recognize that that's an issue, but there are also issues of people that Councilman King and I talk to as we go and walk under the bridges who just don't want to leave. That doesn't mean, however, that they don't want to leave and that they should be allowed to have 50 bikes around them or that they should be able to have trash wherever they want to have it. I understand that the government has given us limitations and that tents may be something that you can provide but it doesn't have to be surrounded as those pictures will show you if the if Emmanuel, if he wants to scroll through them. I went to one location where there are 50 bikes. There's a sign, bikes for sale. That's not supposed to happen under the bridge. But not only that, the people of the area, and we've emphasized the Treme area, but when you go beyond that, we have encampments in other areas that are not so far from Treme, but on, all, on the other side of St. Bernard Avenue. And those places are dangerous. People are being fed drugs. There are overdoses that take place. Unfortunately, people are being killed because they are outside of the range of visibility of those who might be able to protect them if they were near. And with all the language I'll use, the language that I'll tell you that's most important is that I'm glad that the city council is having this, which is now the third hearing. Mr. Charbonnet, I know that we haven't solved the problem because it is very complex and I am sympathetic with you. I am a business owner, but I can tell you all that I represent a district where along Claiborne Avenue, there are properties that are vacant that would be thriving businesses. If the people had access to parking across the street and didn't have to leave the business to see trash and garbage and bicycles and things like that. So I'm very sympathetic with those who are unhoused. I'm very sympathetic with those who have invested in properties that they can't sell. I'm also very sympathetic to the fact that that is a historic African-American community, which African-Americans being always sympathetic based on the plight that we've experienced in this country for 400 plus years, are always gonna recognize that we need to do what we can to take, to take care of those who are disadvantaged. But at the, at the same time, we need to recognize those who have invested in our communities, those who are motivated to see things different. Treme's, the, uh, the area under Interstate 610 was not meant for what is being used for now. And if, not, if it were not being used for what it is now, it would be a thriving area of businesses it's got the right zoning. It's got the right investment opportunities. We have got to balance both and work closely with all partners concerned to get something done. I do want to say something that the health department has talked about a lot, and it's a, it's a very sensitive issue. It is not good to park on a Sunday and just do food distribution in the area. It's not good. It's not healthy. We've been told already about the health department that it's not good, but yet I continually see people do the same thing. I understand I'm a member of a church. I worship. I understand that. But we got to recognize that we are keeping people who might have access to resources from those resources by not having them to go into the, the areas where food is being served, where there are medical services and the like. I know that we do it out of sympathy, but it's a challenge for me when I see that, knowing that at the end of the day, they don't have to go into a food distribution place or a place where food is being legally cooked to um, get the services that they potentially need. That's just an aside I'd like to throw out. But I'm glad that we've had this hearing. I know that we'll have more. I think that we'll get closer one day on it, but it's a very challenging issue that's gonna involve the entire community. But to those who live near, to those whose businesses 
or downwind of the smell that's created by the unsanitary conditions. To those who have family and children in the area, I want you to be able to walk and not have to walk past and on top of drink needles near encampments. That's just not fair. And at the end of the day, I'll just hope that in working with everyone here, we can at least be fair to all sides because right now we're not being fair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Green. Councilmember Harris. Uh, so a couple of things and I won't speak long. My office has been working on this issue since I've taken office because if you look at Calliope and what's going on there, it's the same issue that's happening in Treme. Um, and so we are looking at and we have made some headways and again getting the coordinator embedded into city council i'm sorry into the city uh, to coordinate services that's something that the city council approved and something that we are doing we've also approved money for a consultant to come up with a wholesome plan i know that doesn't help with mardi gras we should have been looking ahead we should have been planning ahead absolutely um, we know when mardi gras is coming we know when uh, hurricane season comes we know these things and we need to plan better um, so, you know, we need to work with our agencies to make sure that they do that. But I will say we are making headwinds, don't despair, because I really do think that we are going to have a data informed solution that will help not only the businesses and the communities around the encampments, but the people who are living within the encampments in a holistic, humane way. I know that Council Member Thomas talked about a strip of land. Um, that the city owns. We looked at that. The city is actually not going to go forward with that plan because they're using it to stage some other things. So my office is looking for additional plan for potential tiny homes and other solutions in partnership with communities, with businesses. And listen, if any of you have any questions about what we're doing, please don't hesitate to reach out to my office. If you have any uh, suggestions on what we can do, please don't hesitate to reach out to my office because it's going to take as um, Mr. Black said, and as many of you have said, it's going to take all of us working together to make sure that we can humanely clear the encampments, work on affordable housing issues, and shore up our businesses, especially our Black businesses um, in this community, because they are the backbone of New Orleans. So I thank you all for participating today. This is not going to be our last meeting on homelessness, and I hear you. I hear you. We need to do these meetings where community can actually participate. And I'm happy to do a homelessness town hall if some of the other council members would like to join us. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman Harris. And the last comment I would make for today on this situation is um, I just want to ask a question. Hasn't Treme suffered enough? It was mentioned the overpass, the Armstrong Park development. And now this, I think, I think it's time to to take care of Tremay and make sure this doesn't continue to grow. Uh, Mr. Sneed, do we have enough people to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you.